is Dr. Brian Welch. For those of you that don't know him, um, he's been a vet at Feather and Fur for nearly 20 years, and that's when I first met him. Um, but now he's you're in charge of the whole thing. Yep. <laughs> and, and so he's graciously enough come to talk to us about coronavirus and PDD, which has kind of uh, been catching our attention as of late. Um, in the past, he's done talks for us on um, beak and feather disease when the issue came up. So anyways, I'll turn it over to Dr. Walsh. Thank you so much for coming here. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you all. So as, as you said, I'm Dr. Brian Walsh. I'm the president and medical director at Feather and Fur. Um, and as many of you know, we're the 24-hour animal hospital. We see birds, rabbits, guinea pigs, dogs, cats, 24-7. There's always a doctor in our hospital. And um, the, um, the proventricular dilatation disease, it's an interesting disease to talk to. It's, it's one that's, that there's new information coming out all the time. Um, I put the date of this talk, you know, or the date of when I wrote this, on you know, the 17th, because this will become out of date fairly quickly. I mean, there keep being new and new information on this and, and new and new um, understanding of things that are going on. So, you know, stepping with the, the first part, so what's proventricular di dilatation disease? What is it? So just a quick review of anatomy. Um, so birds for their GI tract, it, they, you know, swallow food, it goes down their esophagus into the crop, the crop's a little pocket of the esophagus, esophagus that sits before the thoracic inlet. And then from there, the esophagus drops down and it goes into the proventriculus, which is like the glandular part of the stomach, and then the ventriculus, which is the grinding part of the stomach. So proventricular dilatation or dilation means that that proventriculus is dilated. And the reason that happens is because there's a virus called the Borna virus that affects the nervous system. Um, this, um, this virus will get into, it gets into the nerves and then will either cause the GI tract to just malfunction and it also can cause other neurologic issues. Um, the uh, one thing that's, that I want you guys to understand too though is the Borna virus used to be thought of as a rare disease. So proventricular dilatation disease was a rare disease. It would infrequently happen. The whole history, I, to back up, I'm, I'm kind of a little out of order, but there's so much to talk about with this. So the history, it used to be, we'd have these usually macaws or other big birds, they would just waste away. And then they would be found um, on necropsy to have just all this inflammation in the nervous system of their GI tract. And for years, we didn't know. So I'm, I kind of skipped down to number three. It was first recognized in the late 70s. Like I said, large parrots, these guys would just waste away. And so that was where they would just named it macaw wasting disease. And then on the necropsy, they would find all this nerve damage on the intestinal tract where all the nerves would innervate the intestinal tract. And they always suspected a virus, but it wasn't discovered until 2008. And in 2008, it was discovered that it was a Borna virus that was causing this disease. And so then people were thinking, well, the, the Borna virus must be a rare virus, but it actually turns out it's not a rare virus at all. The Borna virus is found in, it's found in, in mammals, it's found in reptiles, it's found in, there's numerous strains that affect birds but only rarely does it turn into this disease, proventricular dilatation disease, and they don't know why. So um, they think that there may be either an immune compromise or an immune mediated component where either something goes wrong with the immune system and it starts attacking part of itself, or if just the immune system is so worn down it's susceptible to the disease. Um, but that conversion between going from having born a virus to actually being sick with the disease, that's really not understood at all. So at this point, at some point in the future, we'll, we'll know more with that. Um, and then it affects both, like I was saying, the, the nervous tract, uh, the central nervous system. So it affects, you can get seizures, you can get um, tremors, you can get wobbliness. It, ataxia is the big word, but where they kind of look like they're drunk and stumbling. Um, it can also cause, like I said, the issues with the GI tract, so regurgitation, crop stasis, whole seeds passing through without getting digested, all those different things. The, uh, the Borna virus itself, it's, it's what's called an RNA virus. It's just the family that it, that it belongs to. 
like I was saying, there's numerous genotypes. Numerous species are affected now. So we know parrots can get it, but songbirds, waterfowl, falcons, toucans, and many others have all been uh, affected with that. And the other thing that people always wonder is how is it transmitted? And the transmission is actually really not understood. So you think we would know it. The assumption is it's like a fecal to oral kind of thing so that the virus particles get in the feces and then that gets ingested or breathed in by another bird. But RNA viruses are not strong viruses. They don't live outside of the host. They don't live outside of the bird for very long. And so it actually is not easy to get infected that route. They also think maybe that if a parent has it, the, the, the children can be born with it. And there's some studies that say that's true and some that says it's not. So it's, it's, it's really confusing when you go through um, all the papers and all the data out there. And then there is, um, in terms of the other issue is like when, and we talk about with this with the, uh, the beacon feather, to get infected with, with a virus on a basic sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a battle against two things, how much disease you're getting exposed to and how strong your immune system is. And so if you're only exposed to a little and you have a good immune system, you don't get infected. If you you're exposed to a lot and you have a bad immune system, you definitely get infected. There are some studies that, one research I was gonna say suspected that if you expose a bunch of birds, they thought only about 15% at best got the virus and of that, of those that got the virus, the number that turned into actual PDD was just a small number, but you know, there, there's really not enough real solid numbers to, to, to say for sure. Um, back to the, the history part, after it was discovered, before it was actually discovered as being a Borna virus, one of the things we did find out was that non steroidal anti inflammatory meds like Celebrex, which is an old person arthritis medicine, actually can suppress the inflammation that the disease was causing and get some birds to go back to clinically normal. So it was just interesting that a treatment was found before the actual cause was found. All right. So now we're going to skip to the last page because the pages are a little bit out of order. So this will go over the clinical signs again. So basically, like we we're covering before, we'll get different ones like seizures and wobbling and tremors, trouble perching, blindness that can affect the eye. And then the GI signs, like we were saying, there's the proventricular dilation, there's regurgitation, weight loss, cropsiasis. But one of the hard things about the diagnosis is everything I said, I can list 10, 15, 20 other diseases that all can cause similar things. So just because your bird is doing any one of those, in no way means it has that. It could have a lot of other things. And so it can actually be a little bit tricky to diagnose. And then the other thing that can be hard to know is when those signs develop. And they can happen with some experimental studies, they happen shortly after exposure. And then in other cases, there's known where it, they, they started showing signs decades after exposure. So it's a very complicated disease. And like I said, it's mimicked by a lot of different things. So sometimes just yeast and bacterial infections can cause similar signs. Cancer can cause similar signs. Kidney failure, liver failure, um, heavy metal toxicity, lead, zinc, all that kind of stuff can all cause different similar signs. So the question then is, is how do we test for it? The gold standard, the only way to truly diagnose proventricular dilatation disease is with a biopsy, preferably of the proventriculus. But if you think of your anatomy, the proventriculus is inside the body wall. So it's hard to get to. So it can be done, but it's, it's highly invasive. There's a lot of risk to it and it, there's a lot of expense to it. So a somewhat cheaper but still expensive alternative is we can go in and get biopsies of the crop. So that's outside the body wall. We take a little piece of that, send it off to the lab, and that can tell us. But one of the sad things is in 50% of the cases, it's not present in the crop. And so if you see it, they have it. If you don't see it, then either they don't have it or you just didn't catch it. So that's, that makes our job as a veterinarian hard as well. And then there's some blood tests, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about this and some of you guys have done this. So there's two different types of tests. One's what's called the PCR, 
and one's called an ELISA. A PCR, which a lot of you guys I know have heard those three letters, it stands for polymerase chain reaction. And what that is doing is they are finding circulating either DNA or RNA, depending on what they're looking for of the organism they're looking for. And there's tons of PCR tests out for tons of different diseases. And each year there's newer and newer ones coming out because they're relatively inexpensive and relatively fast. And so that's why we like them. Um, we will collect samples uh, when we're testing for it, both from blood as well as swabbing the mouth and swabbing the feces. And then we send it off to the lab. The lab looks for circulating RNA from that organism. And then they can say, hey, we picked up Bornavirus here. Um, and then you can also get false negatives by though. It has to be enough RNA or DNA. There has to be enough genetic material circulating to get a positive on the test. So every test has potential positives and negatives to it. And then like we were saying beforehand, even if we pick up positive for Bornavirus, doesn't mean they have PDD. You could have a seizure because you've got a brain tumor and be Bornavirus positive. So unfortunately, I may be confusing you guys more than answering anything, but it is a confusing situation. The other test, the ELISA, so that stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, a bunch of fancy words there. Essentially, that's ran on blood, and what that's looking for, in, in this specific disease, it's looking for antibodies, which is the body's response to the disease. So whenever you get a disease, your body makes specific antibodies to that disease to fight it off. This ELISA looks for those antibodies. Um, but they can also make ELISAs that look for the organism or look for other things. It just, it's just the way the technique is, but that's how it is for here. And then again, just because they have it doesn't mean that's what they're sick with it, or just because they test positive doesn't mean they're going to end up with the PDD. And then for actually seeing proventricular dilation, like the core word of what, we diagnose that on x-ray. So when we take an x-ray, we can see that the proventriculus is dilated. But it can be dilated for a number of different causes. The most frequently reason I see for dilated proventriculus is actually um, just yeast or bacterial overgrowth in the GI tract um, can cause it. Another common reason is uh, heavy metal toxicity, so lead zinc can cause it. And then I've diagnosed some birds that it was actually cancer that was causing it as well. So there can be a, a host of different causes to that dilated proventriculus. So if we suspect a patient based on some combination of our tests and clinical signs, then the next question is, what do we do? How do we treat it? So for treatment, unfortunately, there's no cure. Um, all we can do is manage the disease. And unfortunately, eventually, we always lose in that battle. The, the, huge, the huge discovery in the early 2000s, mid-2000s was the NSAIDs. So that stands for non steroidal anti-inflammatory. So Aleve, Ibuprofen, these are all in the whole NSAID family. So there was. Celebrex and Onsior are, are two veterinary ones. Well, Onsior is veterinary, Celebrex is human. We're both shown to be quite effective. And then Medicam is a little funny. It works in a lot of cases, but there's some cases where it doesn't work in. And so Medicam doesn't seem to always work, although we've had fair success with that at our hospital, just because Medicam is a lot easier um, to get. Uh, the Celebrex, to get it as a liquid, you have to go specifically to a compound, compounding veterinarian because it's not just made as a liquid, it's made as tablets for people. The Medicam is made as a liquid for, um, for veterinary use, so that's where that one's just easier to get a hold of. Onsior is only made in tablet forms or injections um, as well, so that has to get compounded if we want it as a liquid. And then the other, the other components of treatment are just like basic supportive care for sick birds. So, heat support, caloric support, so syringe feeding them if they're not eating them on their own or if they're eating but not enough to maintain their weight. And then uh, treating secondary infections. So they'll get secondary yeast and secondary bacterial infections as well. So they often need antibiotics and antifungals to help, to help clear everything. And then the other concern then, so say you have it, how do you protect your other birds or you suspect it's exposed? 
So when I was researching a bunch to find out like what specifically do you need to do to decontaminate an area, it actually said like in multiple sources, it doesn't live long in the environment, just routine cleaners are considered adequate, so you don't have to get any expensive uh, heavy chemicals. Um, one to 50 diluted bleach, so one part bleach to 50 parts water, or some places we'll say 25. For this disease, I only saw references to 50, but for other diseases, the 25 um, is a common, way and common one. And then anything that's really porous and that can't be machine washed or dis disinfected that was in with the bird, we recommend just getting rid of that kind of stuff. So this talk ended up being a little shorter than I originally thought it would be, but essentially my quick summary, like there's a lot of research still needed. So we're, we're each year we're learning more and more stuff. There's multiple places doing studies. But one of the things that frustrates us vets that treat birds is so when they do a study for humans, they have tens of thousands of cases. When they do a study for dogs, it gets cut to hundreds of cases. And then when we do a study in birds, it's 10 birds, you know? And then those 10 birds are all like a cockatoo, but just what's good for a cockatoo isn't necessarily good for every other species of bird out there. And so we have to do a lot of extrapolating and a lot of guesses. Uh, and it makes, it makes our life as avian veterinarians um, hard and frustrating, but it's still rewarding. And then, um, the, um, and then just the other really key point, I think you guys are getting this, that the Borna virus is a common virus. Its exposure isn't as easy as people think it is, and it's, so it's not as dangerous as, as we used to think it is. And then there's a lot of birds and other species that are all born a virus positive that never get PDD. Um, does it affect poultry? It can, yeah, yeah. But we, don't I, I don't see it much. You know, in terms of the poultry cases, I've seen it where we're like, oh, does this guy have it? Usually we still, it's still we think it most prevalent in the parrot species. So everybody, you know, the, the yeah, and in the waterfall and stuff, it's, it's been reported, but I've never diagnosed it, you know, like most of the, like the most, most of the waterfall death I see, and you guys probably all saw this on the news a little while ago, is botulism. So the botulism is an anaerobic bacteria, meaning it's a bacteria that lives where there's no oxygen, so it's down in the mud. And so ducks and the moorhens and the coots and the stilts and those guys were all like rooting down in there and getting that stuff. Those are the guys that get exposed. And so we had that huge outbreak just a few months ago, but like there's been outbreaks at James Campbell Refuge and uh, where we were getting like two to four coots and more hens a day for a while. And then um, I just had a coot from uh, Hamakua Marsh uh, that came into our hospital with botulism. And is, that, is that because there's no way? I mean, how does it just, botulism show up? So, so botch, normal, what does a botulism bird look like? Or, no, 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 no. or how does the... Okay, so the Clostridia bacteria, which are living in the mud, they secrete the toxin. They secrete the botulism toxin. Those birds live there all the time. Yeah, so they so the bacteria is there all those bacteria are there all the time, but just if there's enough stagnancy in the in that area where they're not getting the oxygen recirculation, then the clostridia can start to really grow and really produce the toxin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Tests for the botulism. We lost one of the baby. Oh, so botulism, we almost always diagnose just based on clinical signs, and so they basically just get really limp. So it seems like you know, first like, first they're like they're walking around, like first they're kind of like dragging their feet, and then they're like they can't use their legs, and then they're like their wings get floppy, and then they start to have trouble breathing, and then eventually, like if they have too much, they they can die. So the way so the way we treat it. We actually have an antitoxin for the botulism, but that is actually, we only just recently got it. It's hard to get to. You can only get it from U.S. Fish and Wildlife places, and um, it only can be used not on pets, but on um, native birds. And so um, they were able to get it because our hospital is now the main hospital in this, on the island that cares for the native birds. We work directly under the uh, Hawaii Wildlife Center's partnership, and. Um, We've, seen, we've actually seen um, over 600 native birds in the last three, four years 
um, that have all come through a hospital for various reasons, anywhere from shear waters just during fallout season to broken wings, broken legs, botulism. Um, these guys that just come in exhausted because they weren't having a good time catching prey, guys that get distracted by lights and end up in stupid places or end up getting hurt, all that kind of stuff. So, if you have, which one's the Alailua? Okay, so, so if you have one, you need to bring it to us by law. It has to go to a veterinarian who then works with one. We would then be able to give it the antitoxin, and then the rest of it is supportive care. So, keeping them warm, although there was one argument for coots to keep them cool. And then if they can swallow, then we would syringe feed them. If they can't swallow, then we just put them in oxygen and, 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 um, and support them uh, with sub-Q fluids, fluid injections to keep them hydrated. And then they basically, they just have to ride it out. Um, they just have to, you know, wait till they get over it. Yeah. Yeah, so if you guys have any sick native birds, they should be going to us. And then we would call the Hawaii Wildlife Center and work under their direction. And then depending on whether it's a state or federal bird, then either DOFA or U.S. Fish and Wildlife would then come out and re release it. So, And then uh, if it's for the long-term care with birds, then we'll actually fly them to the Big Island. Well, actually the Wildlife Center will fly them to the Big Island and they'll do the long-term care. So... What else can I answer for uh, questions? On the, on the um, ELISA and other tests, um, they're multiplying the RNA. Can they do multiple tests off a single blood sample or they need Yeah, no, so yeah, so we'll do like, we can, we'll send like a couple drops of blood and they'll like just do all sorts of like, they can, we, we'll, we'll send the lab like just like this much blood yeah. and they will. They can like sex the bird, do a chlamydia test, do a polyoma test, do a beak and feather test, and do something else, all just on like that little drop of, of blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just multiplying all the genetic material and then they pull out. The other one, you mentioned that um, uh, heavy metals are a problem. Um, mm -hmm. Is the zinc oxide now, the zinc oxide and titanium dioxide is going to be the basic only chemicals for sunblock, so it's going to be everywhere. Yeah, but you know, I think if the bird is actually eating the bottle, it's a problem. But otherwise, I think it'll get diluted into the environment to the extent that it won't be an issue. So if they it, it, they do accumulate over the lifetime, and then if we get patients that have it, we give injections of heavy metal binders that chelate the chemical and pull it out with uh, calcium EDTA injections, as as you may know. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it can be. Yeah. Oh, sorry, should I not move? <laughs> So um, on a most basic set, it's trying to have a closed aviary, meaning not bringing in lots of new birds and not having exposure to wild birds. Um, that's, uh, otherwise, if you do that, it's not going to come in. Although there's a chance, there was, one, uh, there was a couple of studies where they went to just multiple different bird populations and found anywhere from 15 to 50 percent of the birds were born a virus positive. So you may actually have positive birds already and, and it just isn't manifesting. But otherwise, the, the only way to really guarantee you keep it out is closed aviaries where, you know, and then screening those that do come in. So I might have missed this. Like, if, could we bring our birds in and come and test them? Yeah, so we, we can. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can screen every bird for it, but we, we can test if they have polyoma, but we wouldn't know, I mean, sorry, we, sorry, we can test and see if they have the Bornavirus, but we wouldn't be able to say they have PDD necessarily. Uh, yeah, 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 so there's, there's that test, but like, because like a lot of the stuff is saying it's so prevalent, like the, the main reason to be testing would be if you're trying to like maintain a born virus negative flock, you know, and then at the same time we'd say to maintain chlamydia negative and because people can get that. And 
um, and, you know, and, other, and other stuff. But in terms of just randomly screening, you know, like, I, I don't know that I would, I would push hard on that. Like, just like, if I've got my own two birds, they live in my house, they never go anywhere, we never do anything, you know, like, would I recommend testing that bird? Probably not, you know, but if it starts to get sick and it's showing the signs and we're like, hey, maybe this guy has this, let's at least see if he's born a virus positive, even if we're not gonna go biopsy something bigger, you know, or, you know, or. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. So, unfortunately, like, well, fortunately, the disease is uncommon. So, if you do see signs that are consistent with it, it's more likely you've got a different disease. Yeah. But it's, it is the, basically the, just the generic sick bird sign. So, weight loss for sure, change in appetite. Sometimes the, the Bornavirus guys will be eating well or even eating more and still losing weight because the nerves have damaged the intestinal tract's ability to absorb the food, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't, it doesn't, there's, I've, there's other diseases that can cause that too. Um, cancer, diabetes, um, just bad, in, uh, yeast, bad yeast infections is probably the number one disease I diagnose that has a bird eating well and losing weight. Um, so it's just, um, it, but, but that could mean Borna too, you know, it could mean PDD too. Yeah. Is, is there any discussion or indication that Compromised immune systems might be the reason why a persistent thing shows up in the specific bird. Absolutely. That's definitely one of the suspicions out there. Compromised immune system or an immune mediated disease malfunction kind of thing. What, what's the thinking on how important nutrition is on supporting the immune system? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, it's definitely important. I mean, there, there's no doubt on that. Um, the, the, the birds that are on just like the seed only diets and that are vitamin A deficient and all that kind of stuff, there's a huge host of different diseases they're more prone to everywhere from liver issues to just they're more prone to secondary yeast and bacterial infections because the epithelial layer, the, the, the surface cells on the lining of the GI tract and the respiratory tract become damaged with bad diet. So, so it's definitely a big factor. They're, they actually are related, I, I had a note in the, in the paper, in terms of like future thoughts, they are looking at immune modulators like cyclosporin, which are immunosuppressives that are used for treating autoimmune disease. There's some places that are looking at trying to do potentially vaccines um, as well. So who knows what the future is going to hold um, with this issue. Yes, sir. If there was a vaccine developed, could it be like in an oral form or does it have to be? It, it, they, ha they do have oral vaccines. Uh, it, just, it just matters on the stability of the organism and how the body absorbs it to stimulate the thing. So like we use oral Bordetella vaccines for kennel cough, so because those are just squirted in the mouth. Um, there's um, typhoid fever when I was traveling to Africa or South America or wherever I was going that I needed that. That was an oral vaccine. So there are oral vaccines out there, but it just depends on the stability and routes of exposure and how it can stimulate the immune system. So it's more of a manufacturing question, but it's and theoretically possible. This is a digestive. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And that's why the Bordetella one works because the exposure is through the face, you know, and so the, the oral vaccine that we give stimulates the immune system of the face to fight off the exposure, you know, and so exactly because if the route of exposure is truly fecal oral, like suspected, but not 100% proven, then potentially oral would be benefit. Would it be possible that something we could pick up at a drugstore? I mean, like in the future, and if they made it and it was safe, I mean, it's in theory possible, but they're a long, long way off from that. Yeah. But the, one of the issue with like vaccines is, is the a lot of them have to be refrigerated and handled correctly. And so we've seen cases where people, this is just talking dog and cat vaccine now, where they're vaccinating their dogs against parvovirus, which is an extremely deadly virus where the vaccines work at nearly 100% level. And people were using feed store vaccines and, and they were still getting the virus. And the, the suspicion was that, that somewhere in the line of handling, the vaccines were not stored properly and either overheated and then that damaged the vaccine, which is why getting vaccines out into like rural Africa and rural South America and stuff like that is an issue like because everything has to be refrigerated then it has to have a power supply and all that stuff. Um, so 
Um, so like, so there's, there's a bit of a, if it was to be something that was to be over the counter and easily available, just from a manufacturing standpoint, it'd have to be proven safe and stable and a whole bunch of other things. So in theory, it's possible. I, I don't, wouldn't have my bets on it. I think if anything ever does come out, most likely it'd be ejectable and only available through veterinarians, you know, and ship refrigerated and stuff, because that's how most of them end up needing to be. What's that? Yeah, just yeah, just like human vaccines. Yeah, yeah. What else can I answer? It doesn't have to be related to PDD or anything like that. So yeah, so fattening up and healthy. Yeah, how do you put on weight? I mean, like, like I mean, like the the old like the old story of like nutrition. I mean, like the best diets are. You see anywhere from two thirds to three quarters pellets, and then the remaining 25, 35% be fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff. The fruits are going to have more sugar in them, so they are going to be a little fattier. But yeah, when we have sick birds and we just need to put calories on them, we give them their millet and their seeds and all the unhealthy stuff. When we have really critically ill birds that just need calories because they're fighting off multiple diseases or they're fighting off a significant disease. Yeah, so if they're not eating on their own, like we have. Like if we have, we have um, specific, uh, specially designed critical care sick bird formula that we actually feed every day. But we have different versions. We've got an herbivore version for our rabbits and chinchillas and guinea pigs. And then we've got the omnivore that we feed the parrots and the chickens and the, and the moorhens and the coots. And then we've got the piscivore that we feed to the, the boobies and the, the nene, no, sorry, the nene's have their own pellets. The, boo -boo, the boobies and the other seabirds that we see. If you wanted to fatten up a bird that was just underweight, not necessarily sick, could you use like regular? The regular baby bird formula, yeah. Yeah, you could if you if they if you needed to fatten them up a little bit, um, and um, and you could use that. I mean, we do we do have people use that at home, you know, after they've left the hospital and they just want to supplement a little bit while they're trying to recover from a big illness. Is, is increasing the bird's fat content as, is it beneficial as comp as opposed to um, re restoring? Um, uh, functional mass, muscle and, and, uh, the, uh, so so when they're when they're ill to an extent they just need calories to fight it off yeah. and so when they're really sick as long as they're getting calories I don't care but when it comes to being healthy that's where the ratio really matters you know for the for that kind of stuff so just, just getting calories doesn't really finish off restoring health. Right. So that's why that's why health is a road. Yeah. So it keeps you alive to fight off whatever and then you can get onto the good diet to build back to what you need to be. Yeah. Um, I was reading some stuff with um bird muscles are different from mammals. Oh yeah. They don't need um Well bird species between different species the muscles are different yeah, too. Well, um, the babies develop strength for flight and exercise a couple of days and have incredible strength where mammals have to have a lot of exercise mm -hmm. to, to develop that. Is, um, yeah. is that. is this understood? No. No, I mean, it's known, but it's not well understood. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, these guys, they're, they're out of the dark. Yeah. Flexing their wings for less than a week. They're doing things no mammal can do. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, it's its its own its its own special world there. You know, and then you have different things between the runners and the flyers and stuff. So could you tell us about your plans for the clinic? Yeah, so for those of you guys that don't know, um, we are going to be moving. Um, we're right now, if you know where Aikahi Shopping Center is and you approach it, like we're in this back alley behind like the main area in the corner. We're now going to move to the movie theater space that's on the total opposite side. It's been abandoned for about 11 years. Um, so, <laughs> so it's um, our current hospital is about 3,500 square feet, which, for an 11 doctor hospital on the mainland, it's considered insanely small. Uh, most 3,500 square feet hospitals are like three doctor practices that are open just during the day. So our new hospital is going to have a 7,500 square foot first floor, and if permitting goes how we think it should, a 6,000 square foot second floor. So we'll have 13,500 square feet. Yeah, we'll have, uh, <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we, we actually hope to expand it. So we actually hope to have like a, 
like a TV lounge coffee bar up on the second floor. So when you when you enter in, and the birds want the popcorn. yeah. So when you enter in, we're actually going to incorporate what's called um, fear-free design. So um, right now, like all the dogs and cats, everyone just piles in together because we have no space, you know. And we only have five exam rooms, so often we run out of exam rooms, so people are stuck waiting for rooms to open up. So in the new hostel, we're going to have five. Um, five exam rooms on one side for dogs and five rooms on the other side for um, cats, birds, rabbits, guinea pigs, so they can stay away from all the barking dogs. However, if the bird comes with the barking dog, it's going to go to the barking dog side. You know, yeah, so, yeah, we, we, we've joked about that. Uh, we, we actually, what we wanted to do was put like, up on the roof like a margarita bar and a little kit picnic area and stuff. But A and V was very strict about not letting us have any fun on the roof. So, um, and then, um, and then we're, we're incorporating things like every, every room is going to have its, it, a fresh air inlet, so there's going to be no recirculated air. So that's going to help with all like, the smells of fear and the different things, and, and the smell of poop, unfortunately, that can circulate a veterinary hospital. And then all the rooms will be negative pressure ventilated, so more air will go out than comes in. And so it'll help, um, help with keeping patients calm, help with us not even to smell anything we don't want to. Yeah, so a, a lot of these guys are, are, especially like these guys are eyesight hunters, so they don't rely on their smell anywhere near um, as much. Yeah. And then uh, seabirds, seem... seabirds, uh, seabirds are looking on sight too. They're looking for the right things. Yeah, because they have to see through the water and see the fish underneath. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then the new hospital will also have um, more like room controlled temperature and stuff so we don't get too hot, too cold, all that kind of stuff. It's going to have solar power and solar power backup and a diesel generator or a propane generator backup. So if we ever lose power, we're still going to function uh, as yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, yeah, we lose power. We have we, right now when we lose power, we have to pull out those old stupid generators and run up to fire stuff because we don't close um, unless something really crazy is going on. All right, what else can I tell y'all? Any, Any more questions? Oh, I have yeah. A question about you said um, I, I don't remember the percentage, but you said pellet. Mostly pellet. Yeah, two thirds. Pellet. Yeah, two thirds to three quarter pellet. Okay, so why is that better than not than just giving a fresh fruit and veg? Yeah, so there's fruit and veg are, are missing certain things. So like if you if you watch a bird in the wild eat, like they just move from this tree and take some things, and they go to this tree and take some different things, and they go to this tree and take some different things, and so they just eat a lot of different variety. And so the best to mimic like all the different things that get eaten, it seems if they're just picking out some of the a limited group of fruits and vegetables, it just doesn't get everything they need. And so they can do okay on that, but it's felt they do better if they have pellets in their food as well. So seeds no good? Seeds are, they, uh, seeds are they say to use more as a, a treat and a training thing and stuff like that versus a staple. Because uh, what happens if they have a lot of the seeds out, it's kind of like the McDonald's where they just, they love the taste of it. It doesn't have much vitamin A and it's higher in the fat. And that's where we get the hypovitamin A issues and the overweight issues and stuff like that. So, but you know, and then we will sometimes see a bird that's eaten seed and it lives like a super long life too. So it's, it's, it's all genetics play a role in other things. What's that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, I don't. And when it comes to the, which pellet brand is best, I really think they all are fine. Like no one's really that much better than anyone else in my mind. Same with a lot of the top dog foods. It's not like there's a best food. Like there's a bunch of fine foods. There are some bad dog foods too. But the whole natural food argument to me about being in the wild all falls down because in the wild almost everywhere part of the season they're really deficient in a lot of things there's only a few things to eat yeah struggle. yeah for sure and, yeah um, um, and then the right season comes around and you've got all kinds of choices again. yeah but, uh, okay. what's that 
Yeah, so pastas and grains and, um, and beans, yeah, those kind of things are, all, are okay too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cook them. Yeah, sprouts. Yeah, sprouts are good. Yeah. Sprouts is the mostly used up growing. The root first comes out. Yeah, the start. Yeah, the root first shows up. Now, um, why parents have to do this? Try to profess your stuff to know about it. But the technician tells me, told me that when they went to all beans, wide variety, and they found that every species had their own preferences, their fertility, um, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. I hope I didn't bore you all too much. All right.